Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, by show of hands, I'm curious, how many of you are using AI tools? <laughs> Is there anybody not using AI tools? <laughs> Uh, well, great. Well, um, AI is, uh, is taking over the world, I think. Um, so my name is Joanna Lee. I am uh, a, uh, a member of the Linux found a staff member of the Linux Foundation and Cloud Native Computing Foundation. I'm the Vice President of Strategic Programs and Legal. Uh, I am an attorney, um, in addition to being part of the management team. Um, and my, my happy place is really at the intersection of technology and innovation business and economics and law and policy. So prior to joining the Linux Foundation and CNCF, I practiced law for uh, about two decades, uh, representing technology startups um, and some more mature companies as well uh, and, and venture capital uh, firms. So I see most of the people in this room are not lawyers, so I thought it would be helpful to provide some AI copyright basics so you have context for understanding the practical advice that's gonna come later in the presentation. So what is copyright? Uh, copyright is, it's a set of exclusive rights that a copyright owner has um, in a, a creative work. And a creative work could include software. Um, and those exclusive rights, there's a set of exclusive rights, and uh, some of those rights include the right to copy uh, and reproduce, uh, distribute, publicly perform, and publicly display. There's also the exclusive right to modify or create derivative works of a copyrighted work. And a copyright owner can authorize others to exercise these rights also in the form of, an, uh, of a license. Uh, in the context of open source, it's usually an open source license like, um, like GPL or Apache or MIT or BSD. And for a work to be copyrightable, there has to be some minimal spark of creativity. So a pure mathematical formula, for example, would not be copyrightable. However, if there was uh, a creative way of expressing that mathematical formula, maybe um, uh, singing it uh, or, or um, expressing that mathematical formula through a poem um, or some innovative, unique way of expressing it in code, for example, um, that, that the unique aspects of that expression might qualify for copyright protection. Content generated by a non-human, whether it be a monkey, um, or a machine does not qualify for copyright protection. Uh, so that's very important. Uh, however, uh, if content consists of some portions that are generated by a human and some portions that are generated by a machine, the portions that are generated by a human are copyrightable. So if you, uh, if you took code that was generated by an AI and you added to it, rearranged it, uh, modified, et cetera, your contributions to the end result would be uh, copyrightable. So although AI can't author copyrightable content, so it can't be the owner of copyrightable content, it can infringe others' copyrights. So this is where some of the legal risk is. Um, AI models usually train on, they train on uh, pre-existing uh, data. Um, and sometimes that pre-existing data could include code that is owned, uh, code or other content, whether it be images, artwork, uh, literary works, uh, films, et cetera, uh, may be owned by third parties. And if you give an AI a prompt and it gives you output, if that output reproduces and copies um, some of the uh, material that it was trained on um, without permission, that could result in infringement of third party rights. Uh, there are, is some pending, pending litigation um, over AI uh, output. Uh, there's uh, pending co-pilot litigation, and then there's uh, litigation, uh, a lawsuit that Getty Images uh, brought uh, against Stability AI. And I'm not going to go into the details of those lawsuits. Um, I'm really going to focus on you know, what are the risks and, and uh, how, do we, how do we manage them, because these are very, very manageable risks. There is some uncertainty in the law um, ar around uh, how copyright exceptions apply to artificial intelligence. Um, certainly, if uh, third-party works are being reproduced um, without permission, that would, that would create uh, legal, legal challenges and, and uh, copyright issues. Um, but if pre-existing works are just used to train an AI model, 
um, and they're not actually being copied in the output, um, and that's without permission, there's some uncertainty whether um, a doctrine under uh, US law called fair use would apply and allow that even without a license. Um, there is uh, a copyright, uh, text. Uh, there's a text and data mining exception uh, under EU law that is uh, maybe the closest analog to what we have as fair use. And there, is, there, there are some uncertainties around how that would apply to, to AI uh, as well. Um, so as has been alluded to, there are, there are some legal risks and challenges. Um, the copyright concerns uh, that have already been discussed. There's also a concern around license compatibility. So let's say an AI model um, trains on all the publicly available code in, uh, in GitHub, and that includes a mixture of permissively licensed and uh, copyleft licensed code. Um, the, the, GPL, the code in a GPL repository, uh, if that's reproduced in its output, uh, shouldn't be then contributed to uh, a repository that has an MIT or BSD or Apache or other permissive license because there's a license incompatibility there. Uh, some AI tools do, pro to, do provide you with information about uh, third-party materials that it's copied and reproduced in its output. Um, but a vast majority, to, majority of tools today do not currently uh, provide that information. So if you're a user of the output, um, how would you even know uh, whether it is uh, being reproduced with permission, who the copyright owner is, and what license applies, right? So there's a license complying, compliance challenge created uh, when there's a lack of notice and attribution. This also makes it very difficult to produce SBOMs, or software bills of materials. Um, and uh, SBOMs uh, are, are required in some regu uh, regulated industries, uh, and uh, usually when you are selling to government. Um, and SBOMs are not, it's not just a licensing compliance uh, document. SBOMs are also used to track um, security vulnerabilities. Um, and so this is also a challenge, again, if you're using a tool that does not provide the requisite uh, notice and attribution as to third-party copyrighted works. Um, with some AI tools, um, there's also an inconsistency between the contractual terms that apply to that tool and its output and the open source definition, and, and then also the, uh, the terms of all open source licenses. I'll give you an example, ChatGPT. Um, these are some of the contractual terms and chat GPT terms. You may not use the services to develop foundation models or other large scale models that can compete with open AI. Another restriction is that published content created in part using, using open AI may not be related to political campaigns, adult content, spam, hateful content, content that incites violence, or other uses that may cause social harm. And you might be thinking, well, I'm, I'm not using the output of ChatGPT to do any of these things, so I'm good, right? Um, it's not quite that simple. Um, any restriction on the use of software disqualifies, uh, in terms of, uh, of how it can be used, disqualifies it as open source under the uh, open source definition. Um, uh, the OSI maintains the open source definition and um, provides a license can't restrict anybody from making use of the program in a specific field of endeavor. And there are other requirements for uh, code to, be, to qualify as open source, including that it doesn't discriminate against users, et cetera. And if it doesn't qualify uh, as open source, it's also by its nature incompatible with all open source licenses. So it's both a violation of ChatGPT. Uh, it could be a violation of the ChatGPT terms and conditions, um, and it certainly creates an incompatibility issue if you take the output of ChatGPT and then you contribute it to an open source project. Now that's not true of many other um, uh, popular AI tools. You know, for example, Copilot doesn't include these types of uh, terms and conditions don't include these types of clauses. There are also questions about how does this really work with the developer certificate of origin that a vast majority of open source projects require. So when you make a contribution, you're, you're required to certify that one of these statements here is true. Um, uh, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to just summarize a, a couple of the paragraphs here. One is that the contribution was created in whole or in part by the contributor. 
Uh, well, if you took the AI output and you made modifications to it and you combined it with your own work, then yeah, you create it at least in part. Maybe not in a whole, but you create it in part. So, so you're good. Um, the alternative is if, if you just take the, the output and you're not actually adding your own creative content to it, um, and it's, it's based upon a previous work, um, uh, then you need to have permission um, to, to submit that work. Um, and again, if it's a tool that tells you, that gives you the information to confirm that you have permission from third parties uh, whose content is included in the output, that's great. But if you don't, um, there's really no way of verifying that, that your contribution qualifies under paragraph B here. There's also questions around uh, consistency with the Apache CLA, uh, which is used by many open source projects. So the Apache CLA has a couple of provisions that are very similar to uh, the DCO um, uh, paragraphs uh, on the prior slide. Basically, you're representing that the contribution is your own original work, um, or if it's not your original creation, you have the, uh, the necessary rights from the third parties whose work it is to contribute it uh, under the terms of the, of the applicable license. Uh, additionally, the uh, laws and regulations around AI are rapidly evolving and, and changing. Uh, last month, uh, ChatGPT was banned in Italy for several weeks um, after a breach led to people being shown excerpts of other users' conversations and, and financial transactions. Um, the ban was lifted um, after OpenAI AI agreed to enforce rules protecting minors and, and users' personal data. Um, there is also proposed legislation in the EU called the Artificial Intelligence Act that would subject both AI providers um, and AI users and, 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 and distributors and, and others in that, in that supply chain uh, to certain restrictions and compliance obligations. Um, and this is a proposed act that has not been uh, passed into law, um, but it's something that we're watching very, very closely um, because it could, it could uh, have a dramatic impact on innovation in AI, um, open source AI and, uh, and uh, non-open source. Um, what's troubling about the most recent draft is that it could not just uh, impose compliance obligations um, around, for example, data governance, risk management, um, accuracy, uh, liability for errors, et cetera, um, not just on um, the companies that are hosting the models, deploying them, selling them commercially, it could also impose uh, liability and compliance obligations on the people who wrote the code. Um, that's very, very troubling in the context of open source development. And you know, if this law passes in its current form, um, this could, this could uh, very much hamper open source AI um, and probably consolidate uh, AI, uh, AI market power in organizations that have the funds and resources to develop uh, robust compliance programs because the compliance obligations under this act are, are pretty extensive. There are some other risks, but they're not really uh, risks that uh, open source projects and developers need to worry about. Um, there are concerns around um, trade secret loss, loss of privacy, intentional manipulation of AI models, et cetera. But these are, these are risks that may apply in other contexts, but not so much open source development. So I'm not going to uh, talk about those um, at length here. Uh, this could Im these risks could impact adoption if they're not if these risks aren't managed well and they they are very manageable and, and I'll talk about um, what that looks like um, later um, but there are companies who might um, be hesitant to adopt and utilize um, open source software packages if they include code that's generated using certain types of AI tools um, or if they don't have good you know good good licensing and AI hygiene. Um, and even if project maintainers and hosting foundations are willing to live with a certain amount of risk, um, if the adopters are not comfortable with those risks, um, that, could, that could chill adoption, which would uh, impact uh, the health and viability uh, of open source projects, of course. Um, whether companies are willing to, uh, willing to take on certain risks or willing to consume 
uh, open source that was generated in part using AI is probably going to mirror what their internal policies are around uh, use of AI by their, by their own developers. Um, and those range. Um, for example, there, there are some companies today that just completely prohibit the use of AI internally. Um, those tend to be in a very conservative or highly regulated industries, um, or they're, they, they sell products that are really mission critical, and you know, I think eventually they will allow use of AI, but they're waiting for the technologies to mature, so there's a higher degree of, uh, of reliability, accuracy, security, et cetera. There are some companies that permit uh, use of AI, uh, for selected uses and contexts, but not others. For example, there are some companies that will allow their uh, employees to use it for debugging, um, but place restrictions around uh, use of generative AI for developing new features. Um, there are some companies that will allow uh, generative AI um, to develop code that is consumed internally. Um, but not for uh, code that's incorporated into products that are distributed as outside the company. Some companies will generally allow um, use of uh, AI tools for developing code, but they require that the code go through some type of internal copyright review process um, before it can be incorporated into a product. Um, and uh, just recently, I learned of a company who is authorizing use of generative AI, but only by developers that have certain credentials. So these are developers both that have a certain level of um, experience, um, so the company deems them to be uh, trustworthy in reviewing the output of the AI and being able to you know, spot errors and make judgment calls about whether it's suitable um, for its intended use. And in addition, they go through training on how to use these tools responsibly. Um, and uh, there are other policies that companies um, have developed to manage other types of risks, but those aren't so, um, those, those aren't so applicable in the context of open source development, so I, I won't go into the, those here. Um, so how can open source projects and developers um, uh, navigate these risks? Um, these, these risks are manageable, and the tools are, are rapidly evolving to help manage these risks, which is, um, which is great. Um, I do want us all just to keep in mind that these are not brand new risks. Um, open source projects today um, don't currently police the origin of where code comes from, right? Uh, today, there is a risk that a contributor is going to copy code off of uh, Stack Overflow without permission, you know, or take code from a GPL repository and contribute it to, uh, to a permissively licensed repository and create licensing compatibility issues. So that risk does exist today. Anything that I, AI can do, uh, well, maybe not everything, but anything problematic <laughs> from a compliance perspective that AI can do, a human being can do as well, and, and often do do, either uh, sometimes just out of uh, innocent mistake. Um, however, generative AI does present this risk at a much bigger scale and in a systematized manner. So we're no, talk, no longer talking about just isolated incidents of somebody copying code that they shouldn't have copied and then contributing it to an open source project. This is, this is, this is systemic. Um, and, and for that reason, um, at the Linux Foundation and some Linux Foundation projects, you know, we've been evaluating you know, what would it might look like to, uh, to explore potential policies or, or at least guidance for how open source communities can go about managing these risks. So um, these, the, the uh, bullet points that are not circled are, are the ones that we are, we are not actively considering. Um, you know, but, but just to lay them out all on the table, you know, the most cautious would, approach would be to say, uh, you, can't, you can't use generative AI to uh, develop uh, code that you contribute to open source projects. Uh, that, seems, oh, that seems overly restrictive, of course, um, and not realistic. Um, an, another option would be by use case, you know, allow for some, some context like you know, debugging, but don't accept for other uses and contexts. But that's very difficult to regulate, police, monitor, et cetera, um, and it just requires so many judgment calls. Not really, I don't think, a pragmatic type of policy. 
Another option is to decide on a tool by tool basis. Um, so for example, allowing, uh, having an allow list for AI tools that meet certain requirements, uh, meaning that they don't have any terms and conditions that would be inconsistent with the open source definition. And uh, they provide enough information um, for you to confirm, uh, for, for you to comply with any of the, of the upstream licenses, um, you know, or they have features that allow you to suppress um, reproduction of incompatibly licensed uh, code in the output. Um, the status quo really would be just, you know, trust the developer and, um, you know, as we to do today, uh, let developers figure this out uh, and how to navigate, uh, navigate these risks. Um, I, I think that the, the direction that um, the projects within Linux Foundation that are looking at this are leaning is really trusting, trusting developers as we do today, but providing some guidance um, because this is a complex, uh, rapidly evolving area um, and it's, 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 not, it's not intuitive, it's not, it's not easy to figure out, uh, particularly if you don't have a law degree. Um, so this is, this is uh, an early uh, proposal for what the guidance might look like. Um, this is going to probably go through many iterations. Um, it's going to be discussed within legal committees uh, for some of the projects that have legal committees. We're getting feedback from member companies. We're also engaging in conversations with other large open source foundations around what this might look like. Um, so this is a very, very early draft. But basically letting uh, contributors know that Yes, you can use generative AI, um, but please do so responsibly. Um, please confirm that the terms and conditions of the, uh, that apply to the AI tools output are not, uh, in that, are, that they're not incompatible with either the open source definition or the, the license for the project that you are contributing to. Um, and there are some other conditions that would need to be met. I mean, really, if, if there is any third party uh, content that is reproduced in the AI output that you're contributing, make sure you have permission from those third parties under an appropriate license and you're complying with those license terms. Um, a couple of other scenarios uh, might be that there is no third party um, copyrighted material in that output. Um, or that the output is not copyrightable subject matter and would not be even if it was produced by a human. For example, if it were, there was just zero creativity in that output, um, then it, copyright, copyright wouldn't even apply to it and we wouldn't have to have, be concerned about these licensing and uh, copyright uh, type risks. Um, as I said, the tools are evolving to, um, are, to make uh, determination that uh, the output is compliant much easier. For example, uh, AWS Code Whisperer recently added a feature uh, that provides notice and attribution. And GitHub Copilot has announced that this is, this, is a, this is a new feature. I don't know if it's been rolled out yet, but if it hasn't, it's, it's any day now. Some additional guidance that is under consideration, but there's still not any consensus around, um, around this for, for any of the projects that, that uh, are looking at this would be um, perhaps providing a pre-approved list of AI tools that, that meet those requirements uh, on the slide uh, before. Um, projects might in the future also ask developers to include notice and attribution uh, to the AI tool itself. Um, for example, in addition to, you know, if you, if you copy code from, um, from an open source project and you modify it and then you contribute it to another project, you're supposed to maintain the, the license headers and copyright notices from, from the, uh, the third party code that you copied. Um, uh, perhaps there should also be uh, another uh, a disclosure that um, this, this contribution was, contribu was generated in part or in whole using generative AI and listing which tool. Um, so that is something that you know, might be coming around the corner, but that is, that is not a requirement today. Um, some of the uh, other questions that uh, the open source legal community is, is thinking about um, are, should non-code contributions be treated differently? Um, because they have slightly different, you know, di slightly different risks. For example, uh, images, graphics, and artwork. Um, these are almost always going to qualify for some type of copyright protection um, because they are inherently creative. Whereas some code may have that minimum spark of uh, creativity needed to be um, 
protectable by copyright and some might not. Uh, documentation and blogs, um, I think that this is a very, I think of this as a very low risk area because it's very easy to change uh, or remove uh, documentation or a blog post um, if you find out that you've accidentally infringed somebody else's copyright, right? Whereas code has dependencies and it is sometimes quite challenging to modify code if you find out that there is a compliance issue. And again, that's not a new risk. This happens today. Sometimes we, uh, uh, some of our larger projects, we do uh, go through scanning. And when those scan results show that you know, there, a piece of code got in there that shouldn't have because it's under an incompatible license, there is a process by which, that we have to go through for figuring out what to do with that and whether we extract it, modify it, uh, go to the copyright holders and ask them for permission under a different set of license terms, et cetera. Um, and uh, similar questions around should standards and specifications be, be subject to sort of a different set of, uh, of rules or, or, or guidelines. Um, so oh, the ongoing efforts within the Linux Foundation, um, we are we are working on a draft guidance document, um, and additionally, uh, so earlier I mentioned the uh, European uh, Union uh, Artificial Intelligence Act and how if it is enacted into law in its current form, could be very problematic for innovation in AI, um, in open source, and also among startups. Um, so we are planning to write a letter to the European Commission expressing our concerns, um, helping them understand how this uh, act in its current form um, would undermine innovation. And we'll be inviting other open source uh, software uh, organizations to co-sign this letter. Um, and uh, if any of you are interested in, in contributing to, to either of these efforts, um, please come talk to me. We welcome input, we welcome collaboration, um, you know, and with any type of uh, proposed legislation or policy, um, I think the more, more people that regulators hear from, uh, more different types of stakeholders, the more, the more impactful um, the messaging is. So I also encourage you, if, um, if you're a part of other organizations or you know, your companies have an interest in, in this, I encourage you also to, uh, to uh, have a voice in this, uh, this conversation. Um, and this is, this is going to continue to evolve. Um, it's a rapidly evolving area. Um, there's going to be changes both in the law uh, and also in the technology itself and the tooling. Um, my hope is that very soon a majority of the tooling is going to, uh, going to be developed in such a way and have features that, that help take the, the effort out, uh, a lot of the effort out and friction around the compliance um, so that this is not something that, that developers have to give so much um, uh, mind share to. Uh, also, there will be, there will be changes in, in tolerance for risk and ambiguity among adopters and, uh, and companies um, for sure. Uh, in some ways, this reminds me a little bit of the early days of open source when uh, uh, late 90s and early 2000s when there were companies that banned uh, the use by their uh, employees of open source code. Um, and I mean, I, I understand that because there was a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, but um, when you do that, uh, your employees are gonna use open source anyway. And so you know, I think uh, the better approach is to help educate your employees, you know, in this case, help educate members of our community about you know, don't avoid use of AI, just learn how to do so in a way that's responsible and, um, and, you know, and, and help contribute to the evolution of these tools so that the compliance is actually built into the tooling itself. Um, so uh, are there any questions? Yes. What is patent submarining? Oh, um, patent submarining. So patent submarining is in a practice where um, a patent holder um, sits and waits for there to be broad adoption, commercial adoption of their patent technology, and then they start demanding royalties. Um, and there are some theoretical situations in which um, uh, AI models that, that train on prompts could be, you know, again, theoretically manipulated in order to, uh, in order to facilitate a patent submarining conspiracy, but that's not really, that's not really a concern that uh, open source communities really need to be thinking about. Yes, yeah. Because it 
seems like this litigation that's pending could be like the Java API thing. It could take another 10 years before the courts actually resolve it and then probably resolve it on a very minor subset of issues that aren't really helpful to the rest of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So has the US Congress talked about this or are there any bills pending there? Um, yeah, it's, there is, um, I mean, there's definitely talk about this. Um, I'm, I'm not, uh, um, I'm not following it quite as closely. Um, there is talk about it, but there's not like a, you know, there's not, a, a, it was not, it's not a, a mature so. enough, yeah, that thought it worth providing analysis at this point. And, but what's, what's frightening about, one of the other things that's frightening about this, uh, this EU uh, AI Act is that, you know, if, if it is adopted, I mean, other, other countries and jurisdictions are going to look at this as a model. Yes. Yeah, firstly, I think it will be adopted uh, as early as June 2024. But what's your opinion? How do you think EU Commission is going to take your inputs? Because if it weren't for COVID, I think that would have been a loss similar to GDPR already now. And I, I am from EU, so. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, my, my crystal ball on this is not very clear, um, but, um, but I, I will say that one of the things that keeps me up at night um, is the lack of o open source sophistication, I would say, um, in the European Commission. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting, you have some divisions of European Commission who are, that are publishing studies that, um, you know, they're talking about the tremendous economic benefit of open source and you've got other, you know, other parts of, of the Commission that seem to not really appreciate the impact of their legislation in open source. And um, you, for example, the Cyber uh, um, Resilience Act has some uh, similarly, you know, troubling provisions around, um, around uh, cybersecurity and, and who the liability and compliance obligation uh, rests with. Um, and so I'm, just, I'm concerned that there's, like, there's a trend of, of uh, not really understanding open source innovation in, in the EU. Thank you. Um, awesome talk. First of all, definitely want to be a part of that legislation or that letter formation and helping provide another voice. Um, one thing I wanted to understand is uh, I'm actually confused about the this piece of legislation being something that is a threat to the open source community. Originally, I thought it was something that was positive because in a highly unregulated space, there's a lot of room for uh, malicious intent, malicious, um, you know, repurposing of, of AI generated content that are, you know, trained on flawed models or uh, to then do harm to broader society. So having some sort of legislation and having a, on a global standpoint, uh, you know, EU already have, having been a lead in GDPR and other areas, it, it seemed like it was the right thing to do. I didn't realize that there was open source implications that could potentially limit the freedom that open source, you know, provides. But is there a way to, um, you know, strike a balance because I actually did look at the, the legislation like over just an overview and I did say that they, they broke it down into levels of risk mitigation um, and more people are asking for it because they're going to be the new model to uh, be inclusive of uh, normal usage. And uh, rather than maybe negating it, is there a way that we can say, hey, this is great, but like, could we also include use cases for open source that don't limit the freedom that traditionally we have? And, and you even have studies that are documented on this that are showing the value of it. So um, how could we strike a balance between, yes, setting a global standard, let them know that um, you know, we need to create an FDA for a algorithms, but at the same time, it shouldn't be at the um, expense of limiting creativity and freedom. Yeah, so um, I mean, I, I agree with um, the, the general sentiment that, you know, some regulation could be very beneficial, right, um, in terms of regulating security, risk, you know, ethics, et cetera, privacy, you know, all the different types of challenges um, and opportunities that AI presents. Um, the issue with the, the, the most recent um, proposed draft legislation, though, is that um, the way, so the question is, who, who is ultimately responsible for the compliance? 
and who has liability if something goes wrong. So, you know, in, in my opinion, it should be the person who's, you know, furthest out in terms of actually providing uh, AI as a commercial service, right? Because they understand like how the AI is being deployed in action. They understand what use cases, um, et cetera, right? They have, they actually have, and they have ability to, they have ability to implement the governance that's required. Um, it shouldn't be the, the open source community member who wrote a piece of code, who has no control over, is it going to be used uh, downstream in a high risk application or a low risk application? Um, who is not going to necessarily, who's just, who's, who, who, do, who as an individual should not be expected to have liability. Um, or compliance obligations around the security, the, the documentation, um, et cetera. So it's not that I think the, the actual, the aim of the regulations is bad. It's just, it's who it imposes liability on uh, needs to be rethought. Yeah, I think uh, if you think about, so if you think about proprietary um, software and services, you know, into the company, you know, the developers are, it's, the company is behind them, right? In an open source community, it's, it's different. So yeah, they're not, they're not thinking about how open source software is created um, in, in the way that the proposed legislation is, is the, the re most recent draft is currently structured. Yes, I think we have time just for one more question. So let, let's say that we are using generative AI in our code, because it sounds like everybody is. Uh, what tools does the Linux Foundation recommend that we use? Since this guidance is not in, in place yet, what, what tools are most akin to or, or compliant with, with the, the aims of mm -hmm. the guidance so that we can be so, so we can, you know, go there as quickly um, as possible. I'm not in a position to make a recommendation um, uh, by the Linux Foundation. I'm not sure that we'll ever actually recommend tools. Um, probably the farthest we'll go is um, helping publish information about, uh, you know, what tools have certain types of features like notice and attribution. Um, and anything I tell you today is going to be out of date, I guarantee, like three weeks from now. Um, uh, a few months ago when I first started uh, speaking about this issue and helping provide it analysis, um, I, I, was, I was advocating for please evolve the tools to provide notice and attribution. And I kept getting pushback and like, well, it, it's, harder than, it's harder to do that you, than you think. And then like a month later, you know, um, AWS Code Whisper announces that they have this feature. So um, anything I, I told you today would, would be probably out of date in a couple of months. So uh, the tooling is going to evolve. And I just hope that, uh, you know, either through uh, market pressure or just norms and expectations uh, in AI or regulation that eventually you know all the tools that are that are that are you that are being used um, to develop code that might be incorporated into open source project are going to are going to include that compliance built in. All right, thank you all.